right here in Lamentations chapter number 3. The particular verse that I want to focus in on is going to be verse number 22. Where the Bible reads, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. And then it says this, Because His compassions fail not. I'm going to be preaching about having compassion on the weak. Or specifically, I'm going to be preaching about, I want to focus on the Lord having compassion on the weak. This is a theme of God's character all throughout the Bible. Another verse I want to draw your attention to within this same chapter is going to be verse number 32, where the Bible reads, But though he caused grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. Now I want you to turn to Matthew chapter number 18, verse number 33, because I want to define for you what it means to have compassion. What it means to have compassion. Now, as the Bible so often does, always does, really, it will define itself. It will give you the definition of a word. And actually, the definition of both of those verses that I just read was, was uh, instituted in those particular verses. Right here in verse number 22, it said this. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. And then it says, because his compassions fail not. Verse number 32, again, but though he caused grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. The definition of compassion, it's not just showing love to someone as a lot of people erroneously think. It's not just helping someone. It is specifically helping someone when they are in need of something. It is specifically showing pity or help to someone while they are suffering. It is helping a person that is weak or has an infirmity, just like the idea of mercy. God shows us mercy and gives us grace in order to be saved. He's giving us something we need in, in a situation that it would be considered a desperate situation. And where we can do nothing for ourselves. That is the definition of compassion. Uh, we also find the definition of, definition of compassion in Matthew chapter number 18, verse number 33. The Bible says this. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant? Even as I had, look at this, pity on thee. So there we find a more direct definition of what the word compassion means. It means to show pity on someone. And really, the word pity isn't used a lot in our modern vernacular today, but I'll tell you a way, a time in which you will hear the word pity used is oftentimes when someone is in a moment of distress, maybe a, a family member has died, and let's say that there is a, you know, a family member that they're not so close with, and they come to them and they, you know, they tell them, I'm here for you. And what will they say? Don't, I don't want your pity. Well, so notice the type of situation that that occurs and that that word will be used in. It's in a situation in which they need help. A situation in which they're suffering. And what are they saying? I don't want your compassion. So notice compassion is not just love. Compassion is not just the feelings of good emotions towards what someone, you know, uh, positive emotions. It is specifically showing someone love or help in a time of need. It is like pity is exactly what it is. Again, Romans chapter number 9, verse number 15, defined again as being mercy. It says, for he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And then he repeats himself. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So notice, compassion, pity, mercy, they're all used interchangeably. They're synonymous. The modern dictionary definition of the word uh, compassion is sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. So notice it is when someone is in a time of suffering, they are in a time of need, and when you show towards the uh, you you would uh, show towards them the emotions of pity. That is what compassion actually is. But we always get the Bible's definition, and you know what? It always lines up anyways. If the dictionary definition is correct, it'll line up with the definition of the Bible. We can always just go to the Bible, get the exact definition. Pity is what it is. I want you to turn to uh, Psalm chapter number 111, verse 4. We're going to look at some verses real quick where God repeatedly talks about that he is full of compassion. That he is repeatedly, the Bible will repeatedly speak of God as being full of compassion, of having great compassion. We saw there just in Lamentations chapter number 3, even in the time in which God had, had cast away his people temporarily, as far as he was punishing them for their great wickedness, he had destroyed their city, their temple, everything. It said even at that time that he was going to have compassion on them, that he was going to have mercy on them, giving them something that they didn't deserve and also at a time of suffering. Make sure that you keep the correct definition. This word is misused oftentimes. Today is why I want to stress and emphasize the correct definition of the word compassion. 
Psalm chapter number 111, verse 4 says this. He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. And then it says this. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. So he's a gracious God. And notice what it says. It doesn't just say he's compassionate. It says he's full of compassion. He's full of compassion. Turn over to Psalm chapter number 86, verse number 15. A few of these are in the book of Psalms, so I'll just allow you to turn there with me. Psalm chapter number 86, verse number 15. Psalm chapter number 86, verse number 15 reads, But thou, O Lord, art a God, look at this, full of compassion and gracious. So again, we see gracious. What is grace like? It's like mercy. It's giving some, someone something that they don't necessarily deserve. That's what that means, in a time of need. Long-suffering, that's referring to being pa uh, patient, of course. It's an extreme patience. And plenteous, look at this again, in mercy and truth. So repeatedly we see those words being used over and over again. Look at Psalm chapter number 78, verse number 38. Psalm chapter number 78, verse number 38, the Bible reads, But he, being full of compassion, of course speaking of God, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not, yea, many a time, Turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. Look at Psalm. Go back to Psalm chapter number 145, verse number 8. Psalm 145, look at verse number 8. The Bible says this, Psalm 145, verse 8. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. So notice this the same phrase that's used repeatedly to speak of God. And you want to know a, a, a particular characteristic about God's uh, you know, uh, uh, personality? It's that he is full of compassion. I'm happy that God is full of compassion. You know, we mess up a lot, and I'm glad that his mercies fail not. I'm glad that his compassion, that he's always compassionate, and he's long-suffering, right? That God will continually, that those that are saved, God will continually give you another chance. There are rare exceptions, Saul, but that's very rare exception. You know, he was, he was in a very uh, you know, prominent position. God sent prophets unto him, and he just repeatedly would not hearken unto his word. It's a very rare case where God will not show you mercy. It's a very, you know, and when you get into that situation, that's a, that's a, a, a very scary situation. But by and large, God will always show compassion. His compassion and his mercy will fail not. I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter number 49, verse number 11. So we see that God is a God that is full of compassion. Once you understand what compassion is, it is, it is him showing his love to the weak. Him showing his love to the to those who are down and out, if you will. An example of this that is repeatedly brought up, and we're going to look at these specific examples, are people that are widows, women that are widows. Another example is the fatherless. These are spoken of repeatedly as well. And the stranger. God, all throughout the Bible, pleads the case for the weak, for those that are weak. God, all throughout the Bible, from beginning to end, he, is, he shows compassion on those that are weak. The widows, the fatherless. And then the afflicted and the stranger. I want you to look at Jeremiah chapter number 49, verse number 11. He says this, leave thy fatherless children. Watch what he says. I will preserve them alive and let thy widows trust in me. Notice what God says there. Notice the love that God has for them. He says, leave them and I'll take them. Leave thy fatherless children. Speaking unto the parents in this case. He says that I'll take them in. I'll preserve them. And then he says, and also he's speaking about the, the widows, let, and let thy widows trust in me. Saying, I will take care of the widows. I will have compassion on them. I will have compassion on the weak. I want you to turn to Exodus chapter number 22. Exodus chapter number 22. Exodus chapter number 22. I want you to look at verse number 21. Exodus chapter number 22, verse number 21. I'm going to read to you from Deuteronomy chapter number 10, verse number 17. The Bible says this. For the Lord, your God, is a God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. And then it says this. He doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow and loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Speaking unto the children of Israel, of course, he carried them out. Once you look at Exodus chapter number 22, let's look at verse number 21. Exodus 22, verse 21. It says, Thou shalt neither vex a stranger nor oppress him, 
for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. So you see him repeating that here. He's giving the commandment of the children of Israel not to vex, not to afflict the stranger, not to oppress the stranger. A foreigner is what we would, we would use the word foreigner today as opposed to the word stranger. It's not as common. That's what he's speaking of. A foreigner, someone not from their nation, if they were to travel there, he's saying don't oppress them just because they're from another country. Don't afflict them just because they're from another country. You dwell in another country. And how did that work out? How did you like being treated like a slave in the way that you were treated, right? So he's saying, don't vex them. You know what it's like, so don't do that unto them. Look at verse number uh, 22. Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. So notice how he puts it in the same category again, the stranger, and then he says, don't afflict the fatherless. Speaking unto, about a child that would lose his father, or the case before we saw that it was, it was worded in plurality where he would lose his, his parents in general, the father and the mother, and he was referred to as being fatherless. So this could also be a, a, you know, termed or defined as someone who has lost both of their parents, right? So we see here, uh, again, verse 22, you shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. Verse 23, if thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. Notice God's love. That's what you can really see there. You can see God's love for the fatherless and for the widow. You know why? Because it's easier to take advantage of someone that is weak. It's easier to take advantage of someone that cannot defend themselves. It's easier. Do you know where, uh, you know, oftentimes people prey on older women that, that stay at home. Oftentimes, you know, they'll put specific ads on the television when they know that, you know, there are older women at home. You know, they try to take advantage of them. They don't have a husband there to protect them. The, the salesman, it's very well known that even uh, just women in general, when they would be, when, uh, when the men would go to work, that's when the salesman would go out during the day. They're more gullible. It's just a difference in our personalities. And they would try to sell them different things. You know, because they would try to, you know, the Bible talks about how the woman is the weaker vessel. So they would try to go when the man's not there to protect the home, and then they would try to, you know, be a con artist and to con them out of this. So the woman that is left there, what does she not have? She does not have her husband to protect her. And God says, if you, you know, in, in other words, if you pick on the widow, if you pick on the fatherless, I will hear their cry, and I will punish you. So we can see the great love that God has for the widows. We can see the great love that God has for those that would maybe be without parents or at least without a father. Notice, in both these cases, even if you were to just say if the woman was still at the home, the father's not there. So what do they not have? They don't have someone to protect the family. And God says, when there's not someone there and the, and the family is vulnerable or the family is weak, if you're going to pick on them, I'm going to. I'm going to step in and I'm going to punish them. Notice God instituted, God makes sure that he includes this in the Bible. He gives you this warning ahead of time. Why? Because you can see he has a great love for them. You can see even when you read these words, that it, that it makes God angry, the thought of someone hurting the fatherless, the thought of someone picking on the weak, the thought of someone taking advantage of the fatherless, the widow, or the, even the stranger, which would be in a foreign country. And oftentimes they would be ganged up on, right? Keep reading there. Notice what it says. It says in verse 24, And my wrath shall wax hot. So he's expressing this is something that would make him very angry. My wrath shall wax hot, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows and your children fatherless. Verse 25, If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as an usurer, neither shalt thou lay upon him usury. Notice what he, he brought up there as well. The poor. Speaking of people being down and out, people of, of speaking of people being weak, what again is the person trying to do? They're trying to take advantage of them. What is God trying to do? He's trying to make sure that everyone's fair. Right? And you can see that God has compassion on the weak. You can see that God has compassion on those that have infirmities. In this case, you know, the fatherless, the widow, the stranger, the poor, right? Keep reading. Verse number 26. If thou at all take thy neighbor's raiment to pledge, thou shalt deliver it unto him by that the sun goeth down. The neighbor, neighbor's raiment would be like his outer jacket or outer coat is what we're talking about. Verse number 27. For that is his covering only. It is his raiment for his skin wherein shall he sleep and it shall come to pass when he crieth unto me that I will hear notice what he says for I am gracious what he's saying I have compassion I'm gracious unto the weak I will show grace or I will show mercy I will show pity on them I will help the weak I want you to turn in your Bibles to uh, have you turn over to Deuteronomy chapter number 14 verse number 22 we'll see this again 
Deuteronomy chapter number 14, verse number 22. Deuteronomy chapter number 14, look at verse number 22. I want you to notice that God implemented laws, specific laws, to protect the weak and to take care of the weak, to care for the weak. Not only did he warn people about, about taking advantage of the weak, taking advantage of the fatherless, the widow, the stranger, the afflicted, the poor. He also implemented certain laws where people would be punished if they were to take advantage of the weak. Not only did he implement laws where they would be punished, punished if they took advantage of the weak, but also he, he put laws into place to help support the weak. I want you to look here in Deuteronomy chapter number 14, look at verse number 22. The Bible says, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed, that the, that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. The tithe of thy corn, that's a tenth. The, a tithe means tenth. So a tenth of the corn of the fruit that they would bring in is what it's saying. Of thy wine and of thine oil and the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And if the way be too long for thee, so if they live very far away from where the temple is, what ultimately was the, the destination that they were to bring these things to, is what it's saying. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then shalt thou turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. So if they were to transport, if it's too, too hard or too difficult to transport all of these goods, which would be the tenth of their corn, and all of their firstlings of the herds, if that's too difficult for transportation or logistics reasons, then they are to take their, you know, their possessions and turn it into money and then take the money with them. And then as it explains here, once they get there, then they repurchase those same, those same items is what they are to do. Look at verse number 26. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. Verse 27. And the Levite that is within thy gates, this is what I want you to notice, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with, me, with thee. Verse 28, at the end of three years thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase, the same year, and shalt lay it up within thy gates. Now he's going to repeat the same thing about the Levite again. Notice this. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, he was not given a portion of land. He is to serve you know, at the temple. That is, that is their job, or at this point, at the tabernacle. He says this, and the stranger. So I don't know if you ever noticed this before, but the stranger is put into the same category here as the Levite. Notice this. And the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come, and shall eat, and be satisfied that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thy hand, which thou doest. It's something that you can very easily read over, but when they are to travel to the temple, which would one day be the temples, at this time, as I said, the tabernacle, when they are to travel to the tabernacle, they're to take whatever, whatever they have of their ties, turn it into money, carry with them the money. Once they get there, repurchase the items that they want to repurchase, and then they are to have a feast. And when they have the feast, it's not just going to be them and their family. Their family is mentioned as well. It says that their family will rejoice with them. But they're to go and they are supposed to invite the Levites. The Levites are supposed to come and partake in this particular feast that they're going to have. Not only that, they are commanded to go out and to find the fatherless and to find the widows and to find the strangers. People have this weird idea. There's so much Bible that, that just debunks this. But they have this weird idea that the, that the Jews were just God's chosen people and that God hated everyone else. God repeatedly tells them, to treat the stranger right. Don't vex the stranger. Don't treat the stranger bad. If the stranger, you know, converts, he's able to just take part in all of the same amenities or, or benefits that the, the Israelites. And he basically becomes an Israelite. He can marry in as an Israelite. He can become a Jew. That is a strange idea, and that is not what the Bible teaches. God repeatedly cares for the stranger. He puts laws in place to make sure that the stranger is treated correctly, 
that justice is served for the stranger. And not only that, he has laws in which the stranger is provided for. Right. When the man comes, he doesn't only get to eat by himself. He has to go out and he has to get the widows and the fatherless, those that don't have money, those that don't, wouldn't be able to have a feast. You're to invite them in. You know what? So you have all these, all the widows, the fatherless, and the strangers. You know, you have one family that, that comes and they invite some of them, and then you need to go out and find the rest of them. So everybody's just going to be having all the, you know, the widows and the strangers and the fathers. That'd be a great opportunity for the Jews to preach unto the stranger the true God, the God of Israel, and to preach unto them about the Messiah that's coming one day. That'd be a perfect opportunity for that. Maybe that's one of the reasons why God wanted them to welcome the stranger in. God always cared about all nations of the earth. He always wanted everyone to be saved. Amen. That's a weird idea that he's just, you know, God just all of a sudden just cares about the whole world. In the Old Testament, it was just if you were born of Abraham, and then he got sick of them, and now he just wants everybody to be saved. That's a weird concept, and that's not the God of the Bible. So we see here that God has great compassion. He cares for the weak. He cares for those that are afflicted, for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. And he implements laws to provide for them and to protect them. De Deuteronomy chapter number 27, verse 19, if you could turn there. Deuteronomy chapter number 27, verse number 19. I'm going to read to you from Deuteronomy chapter number 24. Verse number 19, the Bible says this, When thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field, and hast forgot a sheep in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hands. Notice that same, that same statement was made when they are said to have invited the fatherless, the widow, and the stranger to their feast that they have. It says that the Lord may God, thy God may bless thee. So notice, by treating the fatherless, the stranger, and you know uh, the uh, the widows cr uh, correctly, properly, they're blessed by God because of that. Listen to the rest of this. So it says, "That the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work, works of thy hand, and all the work of thine hands. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the bows again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard." Thou shalt not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. Notice that over and over again. You're in Deuteronomy chapter number 27, verse number 19. Look at these strong words protecting the fatherless and the stranger and the widow. It says this, Cursed be he that perverteth the judgment of the stranger, fatherless, and widow, and all the people shall say, Amen. When the Bible talks about being a respecter of persons, Oftentimes, when someone was a respecter of persons, they would look down upon the stranger, they would look down upon the fatherless, they would look down upon the widow, and they would look down upon the, the poor. Those are the types of people in which, in a situation in which someone would be a respecter of persons. If someone's of another nation, even in our country, I'm sure there's a major bias that if someone is from another nation, whatever nation it may be, and they come to court, especially against maybe a wealthy white man in our nation today, I'm sure that there would be a respecter of persons to some degree. And God is warning against that. God's saying that you would be cursed if you were to do something along those lines. That God, that God himself is going to curse him if you were to pervert the judgment of these people. Why would they do that? They would just try to take advantage of the weak. They would take advantage of the weak is what they would do. Deuteronomy 24, 17 says this, Thou shalt not pervert the judgment of the stranger, nor of the fatherless, nor take a widow's raiment to pledge. <clears throat> not only that, every time... When God sent prophets to preach unto Israel, and he would send Isaiah, he would send Jeremiah, every single time that there was pending destruction, do you know one of, one of the main things that God brings up repeatedly? The way in which they treated the fatherless, the widow, and the stranger. Isaiah 1.23 says this, Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts. So notice they're taking a bribe is what they're doing. They love gifts, it says, and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. So notice, they love gifts. They're receiving gifts and it's perverting their judgment. And that's actually a law. Don't receive gifts because it'll pervert your judgment. That's what's going on because the poor's not able to pay anybody off. The widow's not able to pay anybody off because she doesn't have anyone working for her, right? The fatherless can't do anything. It's probably just a child in a lot of cases, right? 
And, and notice here at Ezekiel, I want you to notice this pattern. You, you turn to Jeremiah chapter number 22. I want you to notice this pattern where God is repeatedly rebuking the nation of Israel when he's getting ready to send in, you know, the Babylonian Empire. He's getting ready to send in, you know, uh, all these armies to destroy them. You know, the pending doom and destruction, one of the things that, that, that made him mad, one of the things that brought his anger upon them and this destruction upon them was because of the treatment that they gave to the fatherless, the widow. Ezekiel 22, 17 says this, In thee have they set light by father and mother. Saying they didn't take it seriously. You know, they set light by father and mother. In the midst of thee have they dealt by oppression with the stranger. In thee have they vexed the fatherless and the widow. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 22, verse number 3. If you're familiar with the, uh, you know, the, the major prophets, the minor prophets even still, they are constantly just preaching the day of the Lord, punishment that's coming. So that's the context here in all these books I'm reading. Jeremiah 22, 3 says, Thus saith the Lord, execute ye judgment and righteousness, and deliver the spoil out of the hand of the oppressor. And do no wrong, do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. I want you to turn to James chapter 1, verse number 27. We read this last week, but I just want you to show, I want to show you the consistency with the New Testament. It's the same God of the New Testament that it was of the Old Testament. Nothing changed. Look at James chapter number 1, verse number 27. People will say, oh, you know, religion's a bad thing. You know, we shouldn't have religion. Religion's a good thing. You know, religion is a good thing. You want to throw out religion, are you going to start treating the widows badly? Are you going to start treating the fatherless poorly? Because that's what the Bible defines as religion. You're going to stop keeping God's commandments? Because that's religion. Look at James chapter 1, verse number 27. The Bible says this, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted. From the world. I want you to notice the importance of treating the fatherless and the widows correctly. When God goes to define pure religion, you know what one aspect of that? There's two components. One is to visit the fatherless and the widows. That's one of the points of pure religion. You may not have heard sermons about this, but it's very important. Do you know if I had to define pure religion for you, I'm going to use the Bible to do it. You know what I would say? You know, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their, in their afflictions and to keep himself unspotted from the world. It's to keep God's commandments. But do you want to know something that God stresses repeatedly all throughout the law? When he's coming to preach to the prophets over and over again, what does he say? He's giving them judgment. He's bringing his judgment upon them for the, the poor, you know, the mistreatment of the fatherless, the widow. It's something that goes on very often. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows. In their affliction. You see the importance of that. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter number 9, verse number 36. This is seen all throughout the Bible where God will hear the cries of people, and, and as he said that he would, of course, and he will, you know, judge a nation. That's what took place in the situation with Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, he heard the cries, probably of children being raped, probably of children being abused, probably of children being sodomized. It's a terrible thought. You know what? God punished that nation because of that. Do you know the reason why God led the nation of Israel out of Egypt? Because he heard their cries. Because they were being mistreated by you know, the Egyptians. By those of which were, were native or aborigines to that land. They were mistreating the stranger like people so often do. And God heard their cries while they were being mistreated. God judged the nation of Egypt showing again... You know, his great displeasure for the mistreatment of strangers, and then he led them out and showed his compassion on the nation of Israel. So repeatedly, we see this. The same God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. We know the Bible says that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. He was God manifest in the flesh. He's called Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. So it shouldn't surprise us that the God of the New Testament, when he walked this earth, he had great compassion on the weak. He had great compassion for the fatherless, the widows, and those which had infirmities. You should be in Matthew chapter number 9, verse number 36. The Bible says in Matthew 9, 36, But when he saw the multitudes, this is Jesus, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted, and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Notice that. He sees that they are in a state of weakness, that they are hungry, and they're about to faint. They don't have a leader. They don't know where to go. They don't know what they're 
they're doing. They're just basically lost. You know what? He felt bad for them. He had compassion on them. You know why? Because the God that we read about, that David wrote about in the book of Psalms that said he's full of compassion, that was that same God that was Amen. walking on this earth. Look at Matthew chapter number 14, verse number 14. Matthew chapter number 14, verse number 14. Matthew chapter number 14, verse number 14. If this doesn't you know, seem like an important subject to you, it needs to be. It needs to be an important subject. You need to understand the importance that God puts on having compassion on the fatherless, having compassion on the widows, having compassion on the stranger. This may not be something that's preached often, but when God defines religion, pure religion, he says it's this, those exact words, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their afflictions. God repeatedly he destroys nations for treating the foreigner or the stranger bad. God puts laws in place to make sure that he provides for the fatherless. He provides for the weak. He provides for the stranger. He provides for the widow. He, has, he, he, he warns people about perverting the judgment of these. This is very important to God. You know what he says? If you mess with them, you're gonna, I'm going I'm to mess with you. I mean, God, you can see he takes this very serious. He says that his, his anger will wax hot. I want you to look there in Matthew chapter number 14, verse number 14. Watch what it says. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude. And it says this, and was moved. Look at that word. And was moved with compassion toward, toward them. And he healed their sick. So notice, when he, when, when he talks about him having compassion, what, what is mentioned? Someone that's sick. Someone that is weak. Someone that is, you know, in a state of helplessness and in a state of infirmities. You know, the word firm means strong. The end part of the very beginning of that is a negating prefix. So it means that they're, it's, these people are not strong. They're weak is what it means. And infirmity is, is something that causes weakness, or it is a weakness. I want you to turn over one page to uh, Matthew chapter number 15, verse number 32. Maybe on the same page, but just one chapter. Matthew chapter number 15, verse number 32. Again, about Jesus. It says, Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude. This is God's personality. I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. That's some dedication. You ever think about that? These people continued with Jesus to hear his, his preaching and his teaching for three days and didn't eat a thing. And he could start, obviously, Jesus could look at them and see, you know, that they're, that they're hungry, that they're about to faint, they're weak. It says that right after that. It says, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days. And it says this. And have nothing to eat, and I will, and I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint. And the way, notice, he said, I'm not going to send them away fasting. I'm not going to send them away without giving them something to eat. I'm going to make sure that I provide for them. Just like the same God for the fatherless, the widows in the Old Testament, he said, hey, leave them that food in the corners. Make sure that you provide the food for them in the corners for the fatherless, the widow, the weak, those that don't have anything to eat, the poor. The same God of the Old Testament that said, hey, when you have a feast, make sure that you invite the poor. Make sure that you invite the strangers, the fatherless, the widows. Look at Matthew chapter number 20. Turn over again, uh, Matthew, in the book of Matthew chapter number 20, verse number 34. I'm going to read to you from Mark chapter number 1, verse number 41. Jesus says... Or it says, and Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. Healing a man. Look at Matthew chapter number 20, verse number 34. The Bible says, so Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Luke chapter number 7, verse number 12 through 14, the Bible says, Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. So it's the only son that this mother, this woman had. And she was a widow. Notice that. And she was a widow. That was mentioned all throughout the Old Testament. God having compassion on the widow. And much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. And said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the fire. And they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. So he healed that man. So when Jehovah walked this earth, the same Jehovah of the Old Testament, nothing changed. He still had compassion on the weak. He still had compassion on the widows. And you know what? Those same group of uh, religious people that were, you know, that were, uh, they were, they were, they had a hokey religion. It wasn't real religion. It wasn't pure religion and undefiled. They were, you know, they were said to be the fathers or the children of the prophets of the Old Testament, right? 
the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those same people that abused and took, took judgment, God rebuked those people the same way that he sent a prophet to go and rebuke them then. Jesus, when he walked this earth, he's the same Lord of the Old Testament, and he rebuked those people for what? For eating up. You know, the devouring widows' houses. That same God that sent prophets to preach about the way that the widows were being treated that wasn't right, that same God rebuked the children of those same fathers in the Old Testament that he sent prophets that he warned them about the mistreatment of widows. I mean, if you haven't noticed this before in your Bible reading, I hope you notice that tonight the emphasis and how God repeatedly stresses, and this is a part of God's character, we ourselves should try to reflect God as much as we could, as, as much as we can. We should try to live our lives according to the way in which Jesus Christ lived his life. He is the perfect example. And when Jesus walked this earth, he had great compassion on those that were weak. He had great compassion on the sick, on the hungry, on the poor, on the fatherless, with the widows. I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 8. 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 8. First Peter chapter number three, verse number eight. We're also commanded or told to have compassion. And we're not going to look at all these verses. I'm almost finished. <clears throat> but I want to read a couple where this is mentioned. And I want to give you a couple of uh, practical applications in which you can apply this in your lives. Look at First Peter chapter number three, verse number eight. The Bible says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. And then it says this, love is brethren. Watch this. Be pitiful. That's the same word as compassionate. Notice that. Be pitiful. He says, be courteous. So we should be having compassion one of another. If there's someone that has an infirmity in our church, if there's someone that has a need in our church, you know, uh, someone that's like I had uh, used this phrase earlier, they're down and out, whatever's going on, whatever their problem may be. If someone has a financial hardship going on in their life, I would hope the first place that they would think that they could turn to is the church. I would hope that the first place that they would come to, if they really had some sort of financial struggle and they had to have some money right then, I would hope that we could come together as a church and help that family out. I would hope that they would already know that that's what the church is for. You're supposed to be compassionate. You're supposed to have pity on people that are, that are weak. And that remember, that is the definition of compassion. When someone is in need... It's, ha it's, you know, it's having pity on people when they're suffering. It's having pity on people when they're having you know, some sort of trouble. You know, also, showing compassion can just be you know, uh, uh, the, the emotions that you would show to someone. It would be you know, a condescending down to their level, you know, showing empathy, you know, uh, you know, uh, showing emotions and loving that person and at least even just giving them. Maybe you don't have the finances in order to help a person get out of the hole that they're in, but maybe you can at least be a shoulder to cry on, if you will. By the way, I'm broke. I need some money. No, I'm just kidding. You know, you, know, you, at least, you should at least be able, they would know, like, hey, you know, I at least can go to them and speak to them. You know, they can at least come and try to talk to you about something. You know, we should have compassion. We should be known that we care for someone when they're weak. You know the type of person that does it are prideful people. That they're only concerned about themselves. They're only worried about, about themselves. They can't even understand what's going on in other people's lives because they're so just <laughs> self-absorbed. Really, that's what's going on. They can't even reflect. They, go, they, they just go around in their lives. They're only just constantly just thinking about what's going on with themselves. They won't even recognize when someone is having a bad day, when someone is going through a hardship because they're just so just you know, the world revolves around them. They're self-centered. We shouldn't be like that. We should, we should love and care, especially for those at the church. I want to look at uh, Go to Jude. Chapter number one is the only chapter, of course, of the book of Jude. I want you to look at something else. I'm going to read to you from 1 John chapter number 3, verse 17, which reiterates the same point. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? This world's good, that's talking about a financial, you know, uh, talking about someone having a financial hardship. That's talking about finances, it's talking about, you know, money. You have this world's good. This world's good would be money, would be, you know, possessions, things. And if you have that and you see a brother in need, you know that a brother is in need and you just have money sitting in your bank account and you don't help them. If this bothers you too stinking bad, the Bible says that you don't have the love of God in you. Right. If you know someone that is, that is at our church and they are in need of money and you know about it and that money is sitting in your bank account and you watch them have a hard time, you do not have the love of God in you. That's what the Bible says, my friend. Amen. You know, it, it, you know and, and obviously we don't have that type of situation here, but that goes on in churches. 
where there are all these wealthy people at the churches and there are poor people that are working hard, that are struggling, maybe they're even widows or fatherless, and you got a bunch of just you know, uh, wealthy people sitting in the front rows who don't give a crap about people. They don't reflect God. That's nothing like what the Lord's like. He didn't care about money in the first place, but if he would have had it, he would have given it away. That wasn't something that he was worried about. You know, that you don't have, I'm sorry to tell you, the, all these people that are these deacons at churches very often times, that's a fact. They have, you know, they're, they're voted into that position because they're normally like, they're good with finances. That's what deacons do at most churches. They make business decisions for the, for the church itself. So there are people that know how to operate and run businesses. They're voted in, they have all this money, and there's you know, people that are struggling in the church, and they're not interested in that at all. You know what? They're not, that, they are not you know, a Christian in the sense that they are living the life like Christ lived, if you will. You know, they may be saved, but they're not caring, and they're not having compassion on the weak. And always, what is it when it's because of pride? Right? It's because of pride. I would hope that everyone here would understand that, that if there is a hardship, that everyone would come together even. And even if, you know, even if we are all poor and broke, you know, maybe one guy can't help you out, but collectively we'll try to help you out. We'll give you whatever we get. You know, I would hope that if you have something sitting around that's, that's – I would do this for anybody here. If I had something sitting around that I didn't use anymore, you know, whatever it may be, you know, just anything that's worth money, a gun or something, and you were like in a, in a serious situation where your house is – you can't pay, you know, your bills, I would sell that gun and I would give you that money. There's many people in here that I've helped out financially. And if you ever have a problem, you can come to the church. And we'll come together and we'll figure something out for you because that's what the church is for. Amen. And I'm not kidding about this. If someone, you know, if I found out that, that, that someone deliberately, it would have to be a certain situation where they just weren't interested in helping someone out, I would rebuke that person. Amen. And I knew that they could help someone out and it was only because they were just a greedy person, I would rebuke that person. Amen. You know, we need to be caring for people. We need to care and love our church family. That's right. important. There's an emphasis on loving the church, Amen. loving the brethren. It's a new commandment, Christ said in the New Testament. Amen. You know, that we should, be, we should love each other so much that that's what Valiant Baptist is known for. Because you're willing to just die. If you're not willing to give $100, you sure are going to die for me. I know that for a fact. Right? You know, money should not be important in the first place. And that should not be something that we're putting all of our emphasis in life right. on. That should not. It comes and it goes. Right. Very quickly. You know, and that, we should be laying up treasures in heaven, not treasures on this earth. That Amen. should not be important to us. You know, we should have love for our brethren. If you have that, that this world's good. And you see your brother in need, you should be able, you should be willing to give that to him. Amen. You should be willing to give that to him. So here I want to look at Jude chapter number one, verse number 22. Notice what the Bible says here. And of some have compassion, making a difference. So we see here having compassion, making a difference. When you're showing you, when you show compassion, you're going to make a difference. Now see what it's talking about. Verse number 23, it says this, and of some have compassion, I'm sorry, making a difference, and others save with fear. Verse number 23. Pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. We should not only have compassion on our church members, on our fellow brethren. We should have compassion on the lost world out there. People that are unsaved. We should desire for them to be our brethren. We should desire for them to get saved. So you should have compassion on your brethren. You should love your brethren. You should help your brethren in whatever sense it may be. Emotionally, be a shoulder to cry on, or maybe you need to help them financially, whatever it may be. Or maybe they just need an item that you have for some reason at their house, or maybe they just need your services. There's many things, you know, that someone may need. Maybe you do something that needs to be fixed. You can go there and help them, whatever it may be. It doesn't matter. Just anything in way, any way in which you're able to benefit them. But not, not only should we have compassion on the brethren, we should have compassion on the lost. And you know what you know what you need to do? You need to not just you know feel it in your heart, not just you know have compassion on them in their heart in your heart. You need to know, go give them something that's greater than this world's good. You need to give them the gospel. You need to give them the power of God unto salvation. You need to preach them the gospel. You need to have compassion and then go and make a difference with that compassion. You need to go there and care for them. You know, the more you go soul winning, the more you care for people. Right. You know, yeah. that's a, that, that is true. That is true as all get out. The more you go to people's doors, the more you look face to face to someone and speak with people and see people and hear the answers and understand how lost people really are out there and they don't have God and they don't know how to get to heaven and their lives are just a wreck. 
You know what it makes you do? It makes you have more compassion yeah. on people. So you need to go soul winning more. You need to go out soul winning. So not only love the brethren, you need to love the lost world. I want to give you the last example here. Turn to Luke chapter number 10, verse number 25. Very famous passage. Very well known. Probably the most well known passage of someone having compassion. Famous story. Luke chapter number 10. Luke chapter number 10. I'm going to read this last verse to you here. Again, I'm putting the importance on, you know, having compassion. Oftentimes it is the fatherless. It's the widow. Having compassion in general, it, it, it's not just showing love, but it's showing love or, or compassion to someone who is weak, who is in a state of weakness, who needs help. They're helpless, and it's a, a symp you know, sympathetic pity is what the... Uh, the modern definition is in the dictionaries. Isaiah 117 says this, Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Notice the importance of this. Pure religion is defined in the very first thing he says. I want this to sink in. Pure religion is defined in the very first thing he says is, is helping the fatherless and the widow when they're in afflictions. In their afflictions. Then he says this in Isaiah 117. Learn to do well. She's going to tell you, you know, living a good life, well would be grammatically correct. We say, you, we word it that way oftentimes. If you want to live a good life, learn to do well, live a, a good life in the sense of keeping God's commandments, this is what you need to do. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. That's the weak. Those are those like the people that are being, you know, oppressed as someone that's being hurt or pushed down is what the word oppressed actually means. They're being uh, taken advantage of, if you will. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Notice that. There's importance in helping the weak. All throughout the Bible, God has compassion on the weak. He's a great God. We should try to follow his example. Look there in Luke chapter number 10. I want to look at, we'll begin in verse 25 is where the context begins. It should have a paragraph marker right there. <clears throat> That's what, in between the verse and the first word there, that is what that is. It's called a paragraph marker. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto, him, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor. I want to make a point real quick that's very, very much off topic. You guys remember uh, a few Sunday mornings ago, I preached a sermon on, uh, on humility and repentance. And notice how I mentioned in that particular sermon that all throughout the book of Luke is where you find these statements of men justifying themselves. And an emphasis being put on humility is what brings you repentance. And the pride heart is what you know withstands the true gospel. This is the book of Luke again, Luke chapter number 10. And notice that statement that is made. It's a, it's a strong theme throughout the book of Luke, all throughout the book of Luke. But he says, but he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now I want to focus on this story. And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. So notice this man is in a, a state of weakness. He's helpless. Verse 31, and by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, verse 32, and likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And then it says this, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Verse 34, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn. So he put him on a donkey, whatever he was riding. And took care of him. And on the morrow, this is just a stranger that this guy does not know at all. This is a man that, that isn't even of. He's a stranger in the sense he's a foreigner as well. I want you to notice the emphasis on that also with the theme of the sermon. The theme all throughout the Bible. This is a, a, a thread that goes all throughout the Bible. Keep reading there. Verse 35. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host. And said unto him, take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Notice this man doesn't even know this guy. And he's willing to take out all this money, pay whatever needs to be done. He said, you know what? 
whatever money it, it is required in order to you know, nurse this man back to health and to pay for him to have a place to stay, when I come back, I'll pay you what needs to be done. He doesn't even know this man. But notice those words of which it said in verse number 33, but a certain Samaritan. You know, this is known as the story of the good Samaritan. That phrase is not found in the Bible, but notice what it says. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. We should follow the example of Christ. We should follow the example of God. We should have compassion. You need to have a tender heart for the weak. You need to love people that are down and out. You need to love people and care for people. And not only just love them in your hearts, you need, to, you need to take action. You need to do things for people. Whatever it may be, try to apply this practically in your life going forward. You know, try, you know if you know how to you know, uh, you know, do any sort of work, let's say if you're driving home tonight, I feel bad about this because I'm guilty for this as well. I've stopped times. But I can change a tire very easily. You know, I know how to do mechanical work and construction work pretty well. And and I when I pass every car I pass when I'm driving home, you know, the thought crosses your mind. Like, I'm just busy, I gotta get home and go to sleep, whatever it is. But you know what? You should stop and help those people. You should. If you know how to change a tire and there's somebody, you know, on the side of the road, you should stop your car and go and help those people. You know, what if you miss 20 minutes of sleep? Is that going to kill you? You might have gotten that person home two hours beforehand, and they probably, I'm sure they had to work the next day too. You know, you should have compassion on people. This guy, this is not just a brethren of him. And think of this. It's a parable that Jesus is saying, this guy was neighborly is what he ends up saying. This is good with what this person did here. This is just someone that he just doesn't know. <laughs> it's not of his nation. He's a Samaritan. You know? You shouldn't just say, oh, that guy's... Not white, I'm not, I'm not, that guy's not black. That's one of the points he's making here, of course. But there's more than that. He's obviously showing, the, you know, an interesting point as well from this, and uh, Brother Elliot actually preached this a long time ago, is that everyone, you can prove everyone is not your neighbor from this passage, because he says the words, which of, which, singular, of these three was neighbor unto him. Not all of them are his neighbor. So people say, love your neighbor. Well, that's not everybody. The only one of three in this case was his neighbor. You understand? But, but the point is this. You need to have compassion on people. When you see someone down and out on the side of the road, and you know, you know, they don't know what they're doing. They're, you know, they, people sometimes just don't have a lot of contacts, too. I mean, you know, when you have friends you can call, you have family you can call, it's, you know, it's different for some people. Some people just don't have anybody they can call. It might be, you know, a woman. I mean, what you know? She's on the side of the road. She's never changed a tire. Doesn't have an idea of what you know that she's got a jacket. I may have no clue what she's got to do, really. You know, how many women in here can change a tire? That's what I figured. <laughs> exactly. And and I've driven by women. I'm not gonna lie to you. I've driven by women. You know, on the side of the road that needed their job, tire change. You have to. Don't even dare make me feel bad. <laughs> you know, everybody has. You know what? You should stop and help these people. Going forward, you need to try to find a practical application for tonight's sermon. Have compassion on the weak. People that are down and out, people that need help, help someone this week. Help someone next week. Help this to become, it should just be something you do just this week. It should become a part of your character. We want to grow under the, you know, the measure of a perfect man, under the stature of who? Of Christ. Amen. You know what he was? He, was, he had compassion on those. And he said, I'm not going to let them go away. You know, hungry, lest they faint in the way. So he, he multiplied food for them. He gave them food. He helped them. He loved them. You should have a, you know what, you should have a, you know, that it really truly is a sign of humility. And it's a sign of, uh, you know, selflessness. Not selfishness. Selflessness when someone cares for others. It truly is. You know, and that's what, and that's the attitude that we should have. I wanted to first lay the foundation for you to see the importance of the compassion that God had. In the Old Testament, but then we see the compassion that he had as a man, which is our ultimate example. You know, we always need to strive to be that man. We should always have compassion on our brethren, but not only our brethren, we should have compassion on anyone who is down and out. And anyone, you know, whoever it may be, we need to preach the gospel to those that are lost, people that just need help, whoever it may be. Have compassion in your life. Be a person that is known as great, greatly compassionate person. Let's bow our heads in that word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we, we thank you, dear Lord, for being the great example for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being a God of compassion and showing us compassion. We deserve to go to hell. We were in a state of damnation. 
you were willing to come and to give us strength and to give us the Holy Spirit and all the things that we don't deserve. We thank you for your great mercies, and we're thankful that they fail not. And again, we're just thankful for uh, the great example you set and also for the parable of the Good Samaritan that's been told and echoed and, and uh, just spoken and throughout history as being a great example of, of showing compassion on the week. We love you and help us to just strive every day, not just hear sermons, not just read things in the Bible, but actually put them into place in our life. We love you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.